In 1974, I was at Oxford University, not particularly enamored of the course I was on and spending most of my money, and money I didn't have, on spiritual books at the university bookstore. Every week I would go down there, buy a new book, take it home, read it, and all those books ever did was activate my curiosity to go, go out and buy another book the next week. Then one day I was down in the bowels of this bookstore in the oriental section and I was just putting my finger along the row of books and somebody on the other side of the stack of books was doing the same thing and that person must have pushed their side and so on, on my side one particular book fell out and I caught it in my lap and that was Arthur Osborne's teachings of Ramana Maharshi in his own words. So I thought, that looks interesting, that's my book for this week, I'll take this home and read it. So I paid my money, I went home, I probably read it in about two hours, and the difference that this book, the difference in this book and the effect it had on me was that when I finished, there was no desire to go out and read any more books. There was something about getting the teachings of Bhagavan directly from his mouth, if you like, in his own words, that he took away all my interest in anything else, in finding any intellectual solutions to spiritual problems. He also put me in a state of silence, the state that his teachings were pointing at and indicating, and there was a kind of peripheral knowledge that if I did ever have any questions, then there was something so perfect, so complete about his world view, his explanations of the world, how it functioned, what the mind was, how it appeared, how it disappeared, that whatever questions I might at some future point have, there was something in this system, in this set of ideas, which satisfactorily answered them all. But at that moment, I didn't need answers to questions. I didn't have any questions, because simply reading Bhagavan's words cut out the necessity of having to do anything to find peace, find silence, do a practice to attain a result. Those words themselves put me in the state which his books were pointing towards. So that saved me a lot of money. I didn't need to go out and buy books anymore. I carried on with my course with an increasing degree of intellectual dissatisfaction. Uh, I didn't have the vocabulary to explain what the problem was. But later, I think it was I couldn't really accept the validity of an academic approach which was reductionist. The whole of academia is premised on the idea that you can take something, pull it apart into its tiniest possible functioning units, have a look at all these units, then put it back together again and have an understanding of how something is or how something works. It's very atomistic, it's very reductionist. And I actually felt physical revulsion when I read textbooks that were trying to explain or categorize the world in terms of small categories which were subsumed in larger categories and so on. A point was reached when I actually opened a textbook and I had to control a strong feeling of nausea. I actually wanted to vomit at the content of the books in front of me. There was such a resistance to looking at anything that tried to explain the world in an academic way that it made me physically ill to read two sentences on a page. At that point I realized I couldn't continue with the course anymore. I went to see my tutor, I went to see the head of the college, I explained my situation and possibly being a little bit idealistic I, I probably told them I'd found something better and more interesting. And then I took off and decided what I needed was a long period of solitary meditation by myself, away from the influence of all my friends, all the various sensory indulgences that you get up to when you're a student. So I went off to the west coast of Ireland, rented a small cottage with an acre of land. I grew my own food. I took three books with me, which were the Arthur Osborne books on Ramana Maharishi. I read them, I studied them, I practiced. 
for about, I'd say, seven or eight months. Very quiet, very peaceful. I somehow felt I'd got off the roundabout of Western life. I had got back to my source. I had got back to my sense of I, how it rose, how it subsided. Towards the end of that year, the person who owned my house asked me to leave because he had been uh, blown up on a building site in Australia where he didn't have medical insurance. So he needed to sell his house to pay, pay his medical bills. So I, I decided to go to Israel and live on a kibbutz for six months because I couldn't stand another cold European winter. And then at the, the end of this, those six months, my plan was to come back to Ireland and carry on meditating. However, about five months into this Israeli trip, uh, the thought arose in me, I, I have some spare cash. I have no particular obligations this year. Why don't I just go to Raman Ashram for a few weeks, check in with this, uh, this Ramana Maharishi I've been reading so much about. There was a kind of a pull. I wanted to go there. Now, this was an odd decision because I had already written to Raman Ashram asking for more books and they hadn't replied. So the knowledge I had at that particular point, or my assumption, was that Raman Ashram didn't exist anymore. I knew nothing about ashrams. I just thought that when the guru died, everybody went home. So I had absolutely no idea what I was going to find when I, get, when I arrived in Tiruvannamale. I just had this perverse, recurring thought that I'd be hacking my way through a jungle looking for a, a gravestone with Ramana Maharshi's name on it. That was all, all, all I could imagine happening when I got there. But somehow I felt I had to go there and somehow connect and touch base with this man who'd transformed my worldview and my sense of who I was and what I was doing in the world. I, at that point, didn't have a lot of cash and going to India wasn't the cheapest option for the next year. So I did my accounts and realized I was 200 pounds short of a trip to India or the amount I thought I needed to go there and come back. So I just looked at my little picture of Ramana and said, okay, if, uh, if you want me to come to Tiruvannamale, you've got to send me 200 pounds. Then about two days later, I got a letter from my grandmother's lawyer who died several years before, the grandmother, not the lawyer. And he said, we've just found some private shares. Uh, we didn't know she had them. We've sold them off and your share is 200 pounds. So I thought, okay, that's it. That's the sign I'm off to India. So I came here in 1976. I'd already been here as a tourist in 1972, but that was a non-spiritual visit. I came here in 1976 solely for the purpose of um, connecting with Bhagavan, connecting with the places he lived. I arrived, I think I fell in love with the place almost immediately. Uh, within a few weeks, I realized this is where I want to stay. And somehow, without any rational thought, I think it was made clear to me, this, this is your home, this is where you need to be. And as soon as I let go of the idea that I was here for a visit, that this was my home and this is where I needed to be, everything fell into place and I've been here ever since. Namo so, consequent to this decision to be here, there was a, what do I do with myself here? What next? I think for the first 18 months I was in Tiruvannamale, I, I was attracted to the old hall where Bhagavan spent 25 or more years teaching people. I used to get there 6 o'clock every morning. I'd sit there most of the day, really trying hard to master self-inquiry, to make myself quiet. So I think that was a, a very intense contemplative phase of my life. Uh, then I started to go and see uh, other teachers who were either in the Ramana tradition or people such as Nisargadatta Maharaj who had very similar teachings but weren't part of his particular um, lineage for want of a better word. I remember going to see Nisargadatta, probably 1978, and he looked at me. I told him I was from Raman Ashram, and he said, what are you doing there? And at that point, I'd had a, I got a, had a part-time job looking after the library, and in order to 
ensure that we got a good supply of books for, from the library. I was organizing the book reviews, all the new books that would come in for the Ashram magazine, ma making sure that publishers would send us lots of freebies to add to the library. So I explained fairly briefly to Nisargadatta that uh, I was just in doing spiritual book writings. And he, he turned his head, he glared at me and said, you must write about the teachings. Now, I, I don't know anybody else he ever told that to. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, that's not my job. That's not what I do with my life. I, I, I meditate in Tiruvannamalai. You know, I, I, I work part time in Raman Ashram because if you work in the ashram, they give you a room and some food, which is all I needed. And here was this man saying, you must write about the teachings in very unequivocal terms. And you know, I, at the time, I didn't rush off and start writing books, but I, I do remember as that as an occasion where somebody who, in a way, could spot what I was supposed to be doing with my life far, be, far before I'd spotted it myself, took one look at me and gave me that order. And this is a little bit odd because he was the first of several teachers who have taken one look at me, sort of glared at me and said, write a book. Now, I, I worked at Raman Ashram, looked after their library, edited their magazine. Then in 1981, I went off to Andhra Pradesh to sit with uh, an extraordinarily powerful devotee of Ramana Maharshi called Lakshmana Swami. Lakshmana Swami had realized the self with Ramana Maharshi in the late 1940s and was leading a fairly reclusive life, hardly ever met anyone, hardly ever spoke to anyone. I just wanted to go and sit with him because in my experience, sitting with this man gave me the same feeling that I had read in all the books of devotees coming to Ramana Maharshi, that there was something um, indubitably powerful mind silencing about sitting with this man, and I just wanted more of it. So I went off to this man's ashram in Andhra Pradesh, and probably within two weeks, he looked at me and said, write a book, um, number two. Um, number three, I fast forward 10 years, I was writing a book on Ramana Maharishi's devotees, about all the experiences of devotees, how they'd come to Ramana, what had happened after they'd arrived, and I wanted uh, Papaji in Lucknow to be included as one of the chapters. So I, I, I knew he wouldn't write an account himself. He didn't have that kind of mind or interest. So I, I said, you just make, uh, make a tape recording of all your stories about the time you had with Ramana, how you got there, what happened. I'll write it up for you. Uh, I'll send it to you for correction, for editing. And when you're happy with it, we'll print it. So that's what happened. Uh, I went, I got all the stories, I came back, sent him what I thought was a first draft that needed a lot of tinkering. And he apparently read it and liked it so much, he wrote me a letter saying, more or less, you, you are now my authorized biographer. Come, come back to Lucknow, come and stay in my house. I want you to write all about me and my teaching. So, number three. So, somehow, uh, Whenever I go off to sit with a teacher, simply to be quiet, simply to experience the, the silence of the self that I feel with these people, they somehow tune into the fact that my appointed job in that place is to write about them. I, I have no quarrel with that particular destiny. I've loved it. The, the happiest days, moments, occasions in my life is when I've sat in front of all these teacher, teachers talking about their lives, having them look at me, just feeling the bliss, the quietness, the peace that comes from being with these people. To be honest, it's a great destiny. I, I, w I wouldn't have changed it for anything else. But then in the early 1990s, I was talking to Papaji and I said, you know, everywhere I go to be quiet, everywhere I go to meditate, somebody like you says, hey, you over there, stop being quiet, get, get your brain back in gear and write a book about me. <laughs> so I, I said, uh, you know, is, is this, a, okay, I know I can do it. I know I have a talent for this, but is this what I really should be doing? Shouldn't I be sitting quietly all day 
you know, trying to have no thoughts instead of making my intellect be busy and thinking about these things and writing about them all the time. And he just looked at me and he said, any association with Bhagavan is a blessing. Your, your blessing is that somehow you've been chosen to record these stories, record these teachings, and because you're thinking intently about the words of your master, you are intensifying the power of those words, and those words are going to settle inside you and bring about the right effect in the right time. So don't, don't think you're wasting your time by using your intellect to write these books. You are actually concentrating very, very intently on your master's words, your master's teachings, at a level that most casual readers of a book can't possibly emulate. And the intensity of your focus on the stories, the plot constructions, the teachings, the ins and outs of the arguments about the teachings, by, by being immersed in that particular world, you are tapping into the power of your guru, and that's your blessing in this life. Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarna Vimochana Meyan Vivei Malattar Varga Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarna Vimochana Meyan Vivei Malattar Varga Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarna Vimochana Meyan Virei malattal vaalve Adi mudikkundaya anadik todarvin Vira mudiyamei marandu